Welcome to the 15th episode of On Air, the podcast of the Air community with a special focus on clinical use of the adaptive immune receptor repertoires. Today, we will discuss germline databases with Corey Watson from University of Louisville. Hello, Corey. Hello, how are you? And William Lees from University of London. Hello, William. Hello there. Both of our guests are active members of the Germline Database Working Group of the AIR community. The podcast is hosted by me. I'm Ulrich Stobel. And me, Qingding. Hello, everyone, and welcome. So, William and Corey, what we like to do for each of the podcasts is to get a little bit to know the guests. And so if you could give us sort of a quick background of how you got interested in adaptive immune receptors and what you find most fascinating about them. So I've been studying antibodies and T-cell receptors uh, since I was a graduate student, so over 15 years or so now. And most of my research historically has come at it from the level of the genome, looking into the repertoire. And the bit that has fascinated me uh, about, I guess, immune receptors in general is we often think about how diverse they are expressed in the transcriptome, but in the last many decades, we've been learning a lot more about how diverse they are at the genome level as well. And we still don't know a lot about how diverse they are. And that's, I think, what kind of keeps most of my research going <laughs> in terms of my interest and motivation. So yeah, I think that's, that's it for me. Same question to you, William. So I became interested when I was doing my master's project and my PhD project, which were on um, influenza. This was late in life. This was only 10 years ago. And the hemagglutination inhibition assay is an interesting assay. If you've come across it, it's one that uh, varies quite a lot from lab to lab. And I was spending a lot of time looking at results and thinking I'd really like to understand what's going on at the molecular level. Where do these antibodies bind and things like that? And then I heard about AirSeq and one of the challenges for the flu work is the assay is typically run on ferret serum. And we don't know anything about ferret antibodies as far as I know. Certainly I don't. And I was talking to Jamie Scott at one point and I said, you know, well, there is a genome of the ferret. I think I could probably work out what the sequences are. And she said, hmm, you ought to read these papers. And she gave me, I think she gave me one of your papers, Corey, and she gave me a few others. And I, I started realizing, you know, how complex this all was. And now here I am annotating genomes at last, 10 years later. But <laughs> I learned a lot about the complexity and it's just, it's just gripped me. It's really the story. So you're both in the Germline Databases Working Group of the uh, community. What is this? What do you do there? And why is this so like important from the community point of view? Well, <laughs> Corey, Corey was the chair before I was. So I, I, I mean, all I can remember is the, the first ARC meeting I turned up to, which was, I think, the first one in Washington. They, a lot of people were saying, we need a Germline set that's free, open for everybody to use. Andrew Collins, who's a very prominent member of our group, was also saying, you know, there are these issues with current germline sets. And certainly, I think out of that, and it was probably something that, that was raised at earlier meetings as well, we've, we've always had an objective to work on germline sets and to follow the, the principles of the air community to keep the germline set open to everybody. You know, I, I think in industry, there's a, a problem at the moment that, you know, some germline sets are, are licensed and very expensive and out of people's reach. And we, you know, it's a, it has to be a common, we, we really need everybody using the same set so that we use the same names and we understand, you know, the basis of the sets. So that really the objective set by the community. Is this the same theme as the recent preprint you have on uh, BioArchive, where you publish a immunoglobulin reference set? Absolutely. We've finally done it. You know, after years of both, you know, first Corey and then me turning up to meetings and saying, oh, yeah, we, have, we still have the objective to, to reduce the set, and it hasn't come. We've, we've finally now published just for human IG, but 
for IGH, IGK, and IGL, we have published the first germline sets now. And they are free to use. You can download them through a REST API. They also have a DOI number. So every time the set changes, we'll create a new DOI. So there's a good reference to put in a paper when you use it. And we're, we're very keen to, to get the word out. You said finally a couple of times. So I clearly it was a long way getting there. What were the, why was it such a long, what's the problem? <laughs> why does it take so, why was it such a big deal? Do you want to talk for a bit, Corey? You can <laughs> talk about this. So I think there's been a lot of just all of us trying to, to get on the same page and to come to consensus on how we want to move this whole endeavor forward. It sort of sounds simple, but in fact, it's not because there's all sorts of things that are tangled up into what makes a germline set, starting from you know the data that are used to compile and identify each germline, placing that germline and its position in a genome so that you can say it belongs to this gene or it's an allele of this gene. And there's all sorts of caveats and nuance in there that we've been trying to kind of build up, you know, special use cases for. And then on top of that, you have nomenclature. So what are you going to call these things? And because the field has really been changing at all levels in the last five years very quickly, it's kind of taken us a lot to, to think about how do you build a system that's, that's sort of able to accommodate all these sort of different elements but also be responsive to changes that we don't even know are going to happen uh, in the future. And so that's a long-winded way of saying it's complicated, but I think what we've done now with this preprint is really establish a foundation that we can use to sort of build on top of now. We have mechanisms for getting germline alleles from expressed AR-seq data. We have mechanisms for getting germline alleles from genomic data. And as the data types continue to sort of, you know, expand, we now have procedures that we're trying to put in place that allows us to take all the different data types together, right, and play them off of one another so that we can create not just germline databases, but germline databases that have richer metadata, you know, that maybe have population level data attached to them that have evidences, whether they're observed in the repertoire and in different individuals. So I think that's sort of, you know, when we think about what germline databases were 20 years ago, I think we've come a long way in terms of what we're now able to do. But putting all those pieces together has really been the challenge. And it's come alongside, I think, also other developments in the air community with respect to data standards and, again, technology standards. So I think it's kind of one of those things where, you know, we're sort of getting in, I think, getting into the groove now. And hopefully, as we move forward from this point, things will be a little bit easier. I'd like to take a step back for maybe some audience members who are still new to air sequences, you know, uh, to kind of give some more context of why is it so important to have these accurate or and also uniformed germline databases or reference sets and and how the current situation or the current set, you know, has some implications on applications or clinical points of uh, clinical purposes. Yeah, I, I I mean I remember when I was starting out and you you know you 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 look at what BeQuest or IG Blast is telling you and you you have this funny name and it's got a star and there's a number after the star and you think, is that important? You know, do I need to worry about the star? And, you know, typically when you, when you first annotate, you find that for a read, it might give you two or three names as well with equal likelihood. And typically they, they vary in that star part. Well, the star part obviously is the, the allele. And I mean, the, the thing about these alleles is, is that they, they do have differences. They, they have non-silent differences. So, you know, depending on which allele you, you could get different amino acids in the in the CDRs. And there's growing evidence now, which Corey knows much better than I do, as to, you know, clinical differences that those alleles can make. So that's one sense in which it's important. Another sense is got two chromosomes, so potentially 
two different annuals of a gene, or maybe they're the same. Maybe it's homozygous and you have the same allele twice. And that can make a difference to expression levels. So people frequently look at expression levels of, of genes and alleles, but that issue, you know, have you got an allele that codes for something that makes a difference to disease response? And do you have it just once or do you have it just twice? So you get double the expression. You know, those those things are important. And they're things that, you know, by and large we can we can tell now by doing personal genotyping. I mean the other things, the other reasons you want a, a good germline set, if you want to estimate SHM, well you're you're looking at you know, how many nucleotide differences there are on average from sequences in your reference set. If your reference set is incomplete, then you're probably going to get a, a higher estimate of SHM than, than truth. And that matters a little bit with humans. It does matter a little bit with humans, but it matters an awful lot more with animal species where you might have a very sparse germline set. You might have one that, that is even missing genes. So it can make a big difference then. Clonial lineages, if you're tra tracing clonial lineages, you want to know where you know, your, your clone has originated from in, in B cells. Then again, knowing what the original germline sequence was is important. So I think there are good reasons for, for using a, an, an accurate germline set. And I, I would just expand on that just a little bit to say, you know, one thing that we've also come to really appreciate is that there's a lot of variation in the population, both with respect to within and between different ancestral backgrounds. And I think this is an um, sort of an important thing for users of germline databases or, you know, folks who are analyzing air seek data in general to be aware of if you are doing a study and you know an African population or an East Asian population, yet the germline database you're using has been primarily comprised of uh, you know, European samples, you may over infer the level of mutation, or you may have more ambiguous germline calls in your data set. And this is something that you know I think all of us in the community have have sort of come to appreciate more and more as we've sequenced individuals outside of sort of European backgrounds. But I think, you know, it's an important one to sort of continue to consider because we certainly haven't sampled the full breadth of the human population. And I think, you know, this is an important, an important sort of effort on, I think, all of our parts to, to try to sort of equalize the sampling that we do. And I think that Understanding that better in the context of germlines is really important, and it's certainly one of the one of our you know primary objectives at the moment is is really trying to get that information into germline databases as well. Where have these alleles been seen? Where do these germlines originate? Just because I think that's that's useful information as you're analyzing data. What is this relationship between germlines and and different alleles? So. Do we have a small set of germlines and then just a huge variation on the alleles, or do we have a large set of germlines in the human population? You mentioned a bit that it depends also on geographic locations. Yeah, so, you know, any given sort of human genome, if we were to take the heavy chain, for example, is going to have somewhere between 40 and 60 germline genes that you might expect to see in a, in a given repertoire data set. Some of those may be used at very low frequencies, whereas others may be utilized at much higher frequencies. But in terms of those that we would say have open reading frames in the genome or that have the potential to be, you know, sort of put into the repertoire through VDJ recombination, yeah, we're, we're talking 40 to 60. And that number varies, can vary considerably because we now appreciate that there's lots of structural variation. So these, these large deletions and insertions or duplication that can result in, in sort of big differences between two human haplotypes or two individuals. So you have that kind of structure at the genome level in terms of haplotypes and the number of genes that are present. And then on top of that, 
there's just a very wide range in the number of alleles that, that can be observed at those. So there are some genes that maybe have one, two, three, or a handful of known alleles. And then we have other genes that at the moment have 20 or more known alleles. That still at some level probably reflects some sort of sampling biases that, that have, you know, really been the result of how difficult these loci are to sequence and are, have been difficult to sequence historically. So I think we're going to find that there's a lot more alleles out there in the population. Pretty much every study that has looked at germline allelic variation in recent times finds novel alleles. So we're, I think we're very far from saturating sort of known diversity in the locus. And to be honest, we continue to find new genes, actually. So there's plenty more to sort of understand about what's going on at the genomic level. And of course, the impacts of that trickle down technically to the germline databases, how you represent those, how you name them. Uh, so yeah, I, I guess to answer your question directly, it's a little bit of both, right? We have differences in, in gene copy numbers within a person, and then we have uh, lots of variation uh, between individuals and then even population. I, th I think it's worth saying though, our, our germline set isn't the biggest germline set you can find. I mean, we, we've been very careful, particularly in putting this first one together, to make sure that the solid evidence for the sequences that we're putting in. So typically, we want to see it in two studies that we trust that have deposited data in, in GenBank or, or in one of those studies, but also a, a, a good confirmation from AirSeq data. So, I mean, we have in IGHV, for example, there are about 190 alleles, about 200 alleles in our germline set. And there are at least 150 more IGHV alleles that you can find in GenBank and, you know, have recognized names that people would, would, would recognize. And we decided the evidence for those wasn't solid enough. And you can look at, there's a wide variation there. You can look at some and, and, you know, see quite clearly they came from an early study where, you know, there were known sequencing errors in other sequences. And so that, and that's the only place that something has been seen. We, we won't put it into our set. We'll, we'll wait and see whether new evidence comes to light. But then there are others where, you know, maybe it's a little bit more questionable and, um, we, we, might see, we might see more evidence for an allele in the future. But if you go to the other extreme, you know, people have published germline sets with 10,000 IGHV alleles in them. And, you know, if you start deriving germline sets from RNA-seq, you know, short-read RNA-seq data, which is about, you know, the, the noisiest you can get, you will find a, a lot of what we regard as false positives. So I think we will see our set get a lot bigger over the years. In terms of how well it works today, we've run test baseline checks of our, our database against a Northern European set of, of repertoires. And we, we publish the results in our paper. We're finding very good coverage for the, the alleles that we have. We think we've, we've got most of the alleles in that population now. We will, as Corey said, find plenty more new alleles, but we don't think having the biggest germline set is the most important thing. We, we, we think it's important to be based on, on solid evidence. Why do you think it's so difficult to have, to, I guess, get to this accurate database or, or reference set? It's a very, I mean, particularly IGHV is a very challenging locus to, to sequence. There are lots of extremely similar regions in it. And I mean, an obvious issue is, is if you use uh, short reads to sequence it, you'll find multiple places where the short reads might align. So assembler has a, a very hard job of it. You know, even with the best, highest quality long read sequencing, it's, it's still a challenge. And you look at the, the data, you know, the, the, the sequences that have been identified in, in GenBank, some of them date back to the 70s. And 
you know, there are other challenges as well. I mean, are you are you absolutely sure that you've you've taken your sequence from a an unrearranged cell as opposed to a rearranged cell? It's a problem as well. Boring. <laughs> what would you add? This is your field. Yeah, I wouldn't add too much to that, but yeah, I think I think in a nutshell, you know, these are some of the last sort of regions of the genome to get the attention uh, that they deserve it's they aren't the only places in the genome right if you sort of think more generically about how genome sequencing and assembly has gotten done they aren't they aren't the only places in the genome that that we've struggled as a community to get right uh, but they are definitely one of the main regions and they're complicated within an individual genome but they're you know also complicated as i meant i mentioned earlier at the population level and so this has really presented a lot of challenges for sort of standard approaches that we use for most other pieces of the genome, which aren't quite so variable. And honestly, that's, that's been the main reason that, you know, doing genetics in these loci has been difficult. And that, that's, not, that's not exclusive to human. We see this the exact same problem plays out in pretty much any species where people have spent the time to look we see the same trends. So that's obviously hindered our ability to make um, good comprehensive germline sets, but it also means that we haven't explored a lot of the biology in these loci at the genome level either, uh, which I think is also going to be important for us to do as we move forward. Um, yeah. And, and just to make the point about quality over quantity, I think, you know, that's one of the, I think that's, from an ARC perspective, that's been one of the really, I think, most important activities that we've tried to engage in, right, is that it's not just about adding more and more and more. It's about thinking about, you know, what are the criteria that we think are important that can be applied across the board to any sequence that's put forward to say this one, you know, this one's high quality or, or it meets these particular metrics. And so therefore we let it come into the database because you don't want a database that's littered with a bunch of noise. That's just as bad as having an incomplete database, if not worse in some cases, because then you over infer or you misassign to something that's not even a genuine allele, right? So it's about striking that balance, but also coming up with robust criteria that we can apply now, especially as we move forward and the, the data get bigger and bigger, we have processes in place to sort of review these things as they come through. None of that infrastructure was really, has really been there, right? Because the way that we've compiled germlines in the past has been very slow and very tedious, but the, the onslaught of data that's, that's come in recent years and is going to continue to come as we go forward is not going to allow for that slow trickle, right? We're going to have to have ways to sort of deal with larger data sets at a given time. So again, one of the big things with this germ mindset is trying to set that foundation in place to say, okay, now we, we can sort of open up and start taking in more data and, and systematically follow this process so that we can, we can make bigger and hopefully more robust data. I was wondering, so what would be the ideal cell population to sequence the uh, loci? And I, cause I imagine B cells would be inherently bad for this, no? Because of somatic hybrid mutation. They are not great. Yeah, which is presented, that, that's sort of another <laughs> ancillary problem for the genomics field. There's a lot of genomics work in the last couple of decades from a reference standpoint have come from lymphoblastoid cell lines, which are basically immortalized B cell lines. So it turns out you can, you can use these to characterize variation and in the IG loci, and they're of course fine to, char to characterize variation in T cell receptor loci. But to your question directly, yes, there is. A, you can find evidence of somatic carbon mutation, and you can find evidence of VDJ recombination cell line. So anyone who's doing work in those, and and you know William and I, and, and my lab in particular, we we do use these cell lines because they're replenishable. That's the advantage they have. You have to be careful. You just have to be aware that that those potential issues are there and, and you have to account for them in the way that you both process and analyze the data. 
in an ideal world, you're going to take from some somatic tissue that doesn't have immune cells in it. And that's typically problematic because at least in the clinic, that's not often what we're doing, right? We typically have access to blood. So again, being aware that one is sequencing from blood is important, particularly if this was, you know, from someone who had, you know, some malignancy or, or something of that effect that you'd want to make sure that you aren't, you know, biasing your genomic results for some clonal abnormalities. But by and large, if you're taking, say, you know, PBMCs or whole blood from an individual, you can still resolve very high quality genomic assemblies for both TCR and, and Ig loci. But it is, again, it's always good to sort of be in tune with the fact that, you know, you could have some rearranged B cells or T cells in. But I was more wondering, so if you would take PBMCs and deplete the B cells and sequence yep. the, then you would have very little somatic harbor mutation, I guess, in that's, the T cells. And the other correct. way around, you could use B cells for sequencing that's the correct. Um, TCLOs. But this is not how it's done. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> I would say routinely, well, I, there's really not a routine, I guess I should say, right? I mean... There's, there are very few groups on the globe who kind of dabble in genomic sequencing of these loci. From our experience, the effort going into sort of sorting out cells to sort of deplete B cells or deplete T cells is not really worth the effort. As long as you are aware and we have enough experience now to sort of know what potential red flags there are, you can sort of mitigate any of those problems as they arise but yeah i think in an, i think if if you wanted to deplete you know or you know just take off neutrophils or whatever that's definitely a very good approach uh, but it's i would say it's not a requirement so following up on that question i guess uh, if you were right if, if we don't have the perfect um, or good germline reference or database at the moment and you were trying to study the repertoires in patients who right, try to identify repertoires are relevant for a specific disease other than doing individual genotyping for each patient. Are there other tools or sort of workarounds to kind of identify, you know, more accurate uh, sequences that are specifically kind of contributing to the disease? Yes, there are tools now that will look at an AirSeq repertoire and infer a, what you can call a a personalized genotype. So they'll, they'll tell you what alleles are, are in that individual. And in some cases, they can even do haplotyping. So because the, the, the V and the J always recombine on the same chromosome, if somebody has two different alleles of a J gene, you can look at the V alleles that recombine with each of those J gene alleles. And that will help you sort out which of them are on which chromosome. So you, you can you, you can get some interesting stuff out of that. You know, you can you can see whether somebody is homozygous or heterozygous for particular genes. But also these these tools are, are pretty good at telling you if, if there are new alleles that are not in the reference set, what we call novel alleles, which just means they're not in the reference set that you're using. At the moment, and you know, the more common those are expressed in your repertoire, the the more likely the tool is to spot them. So the more important it is for your experiment, the more likely they are to to see them. And we think that um, you know, if possible, you should run a, a personalizing tool like this on on any repertoire, really. But particularly if you're if you're going into populations outside the Kind of northern European. I mean, the, the best known tools, there's a tool in the incantation suite called Tigger, which is, is very easy to configure into your annotation pipeline if you, particularly if you use the incantation suite. There's a, a tool called IG Discover, which is, is widely used by those of us who, who go searching for novel alleles. And that, that's really a tool that, that you would run. Standalone, I guess you, you you'd use it as another 
analysis tool, but it's not really part of the pipeline in the same way. Tartis is an annotation tool that, that has this capability embedded in it. And um, Mixer has a, a tool which I haven't looked at. It's come out relatively recently that, that does inference. So there are there are tools, and all these tools are supported today. You know, they're, they're, they're all actively supported and worked on today. So I think that there are there are good tools out there. I mean, as a community, we we need to do a a better job of integrating them and making them easy to use. You know, if we could get them onto the Bequest and the IG Blast websites, that that would be great. But they are there, and they're they're not so hard to use. And you will learn interesting things about your data if you run them as well. And, you know, more ways of differentiating between the different subjects that you sequence in your study. You know, you might find that some of them are missing some genes or at least, you know, those genes aren't expressing in their repertoires. And you might find these, you know, these issues of over or under expression that we've, we've talked about. Some alleles of a gene that just are inherently expressed at a lower level than, than others. It's another <laughs> kind of interesting thing. So, you know, if you, if you just do a very sort of straightforward expression analysis, gene by gene, you, you could be missing a, a lot of useful detail there. I was wondering a little bit going back to the, to the sequences of the, um, well, the V genes. So how is it with the promoters? They each have their own promoter. Uh, do they differ in any way? And is this also reflected somehow in the alleles? And how does this affect everything on the for the B cell? <laughs> yeah, those are really, those are all million dollar questions, I think. So we don't, uh, in human, we don't know a lot about the regulatory mechanisms involved. We can sort of extrapolate from, you know, what's been done in, in sort of targeted studies or what's been done in animal models. Most, honestly, most of what we know about VDJ recombination and what these loci are doing during B-cell development come from studies of mouse, which have, have really taught us a lot. But I think, you know, the, the shortcomings of the mouse model are, one, the mouse locus doesn't look anything like a human locus except for the fact that it has V, D, and J segments in it. But there's no sort of homology between the mouse IG loci or the mouse TCR loci and what we see in the human gene. So those, those components are there, but from a sequence alignment standpoint, it's not as though you can put them side by side. So that's one sort of limitation of kind of extrapolating from mouse to human. The other uh, is that mouse models are inbred organisms. And so what we learn from a mouse is what you could learn from one single haplotype, right? Because these are just haploid organisms. And so there's a missing piece there, which is when you start thinking about the human population, we know that we aren't all walking around with the same haplotype. Our loci aren't identical. And so I think because of that and all the technical sort of hurdles we, we've alluded to or mentioned earlier, you know, they've plagued any sort of efforts to also try to get at what are the regulatory mechanisms um, human loci. So that's a long-winded way of saying we don't know. I think that we're starting to be able to come to these questions because the genomic technologies, particularly long read sequencing, are letting us now access these regions in human population. And so now it's really going to be about kind of trying to build, you know, better experimental designs, being able to get, you know, B cells at the right stages in development. We can start putting all these pieces together. So I think you need individual level haplotypes. You need to be able to get B cells, you know, as they're going from pro and pre B B cell stages into the sort of naive state. And then we need to be able to leverage kind of these standard epigenetic assays or chip seek, you know, to look at transcription factor binding, DNA methylation, all of these things, right, have basically not been done effectively in, in human samples. 
And so when we start thinking about what's a promoter look like for a V gene, it's sort of like, what? Well, well, I um, don't know. Right? <laughs> we can sort of, again, we can guess where we think some of these are, um, but it's, it's undoubtedly going to be uh, much more complex than just um, identifying kind of promoter elements. There's, we, we already know, again, if we extrapolate from mouse, that there's going to be 3D chromatin structure that at play, there's going to be, you know, um, you know, key transcription factors that are, are coming in and sort of regulating how the how the locus sort of loops up on itself during BDJ. But we're we're getting hints of this now. We, we now know, right, that there are genetic variants within these loci that that directly correlate with the levels of that you observe in a repertoire of, of given V gene. And so the, the signatures are there in the genome. Now we just have to go chase down what those genetic variants are associated with. At the, at the sort of uh, molecular genetic. I think if you look at the if you look at the regions immediately surrounding, you know, what we call the gene itself, which isn't even the gene, you know, because the regions are part of the gene, and you can't even call it the coding region because in V genes the the leader gets translated as well. So you know, what do you call it? A, and you can't call it the regulatory regions because, as Corey said, Luna, there's lots of other stuff. But it, it's if you take those surrounding regions, you know, with V genes, the leader, I mean, the, the leaders are identified and they're quite interesting, actually, because they do vary. You do see variation in the leaders. And we don't know how well that's associated with different alleles. We have the data now, but it hasn't been looked at in, in depth. Also, when I've been annotating leaders, I, I kind of every now and then think there might be the opportunity for some alternative splicing going on in, in the leader. And, you know, that's something else that's never been looked at. And we, we have the data on, on VDJ base. You know, we're, we're putting Corey's sequences up there. They're annotated. And, you know, hopefully very soon we'll have AirSeq repertoires from the, the same subjects as well. So there'll be a you know, I think there's a lot of interesting study that can be done there. And then if you look at the the other end, if you look at these RSS sequences, which are the ones that come into play during recombination, you've got these very short sequences. And I mean, they are surprisingly heavily conserved. I mean, they're just weirdly heavily conserved for a particular gene. You know, the RSS for, for that gene is is quite likely to be very strongly conserved. There are different RSS sequences, and they're quite distant from each other. So it's kind of, you know, there are just a few sequences that seem to work. And, you know, in the past, these have been called the canonical RSS sequences. But then every now and then you find a gene that has a different sequence, a non-canonical sequence, and yet it still combines. Does it combine as well? Does it combine with everything? You know, now we've got the data or we're starting to get the data that, that we can look at these projects, so look at these things. I think there's opportunity for a lot of projects to be done there. They don't have to be long projects. And, and the data, you know, as I said, is, is coming online. We, we do have quite a lot of genomic data now. But we don't have the corresponding AirSeq online yet, we, but we have the repertoires. It's just a matter of pushing them through the pipelines. Yeah, what's interesting, I think, just again, if you were to sort of take a look back in time, we've sort of kind of always been aware that that these genes have elements, right? That you have a leader, you have an intron, you have the RS sequence. But from a germline database standpoint, our focus has really always been, for the most part, you know, centered around that V exon, which is really, this is the bit that we can align air secret. And so I think as William was alluding to, starting to think about how you incorporate information outside of the genes, even in intergenic space. Not that those would necessarily directly be utilized for aligning air seek reads, but that that information can be kind of compiled and gathered and made available to the community of, of air seek users so that they have additional context, right? I think as we go forward, we're going to learn a lot more about your question, which is, you know, this variation we see in the coding bit, you know, in the in the region in which 
we use to define alleles, does that have linkage or genetic association to some of these other bits outside of the coding segment that are more likely to, to be involved in sort of the toggling of VDJ recombinant? We sort of already have evidence in a paper we just published that that's, that is potentially going to be the case, right? That a lot of these variants that associate really strongly with usage in the repertoire also have these strong sort of genetic links or associations with different coding alleles. And so these things might end up being ultimately kind of packaged together. How they'll get used by an AirSeq user, I think, remains to be seen. There certainly is biological information to be extracted from those associations. Um, it's just at the moment, you know, there isn't, we don't have database structure to, to really share that effectively. But that's something that we're kind of constantly thinking about. Because again, I, I do think it'll be useful uh, as we move forward. I think we might want to talk about the constant region as well. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was that mouse paper, Bell C mouse paper a couple of years ago where we published some constant region analysis from a, an AirSeq study and even did some haplotyping on the, the constant region, the hybrid mouse that was sequenced. And we're starting to get constant region sequences in in your from your work now. And they ain't so constant, is the <laughs> the first thing I think. You know, there's there's variation there's a lot more variation there than you might expect. They're not boring. And again, that's that's another area where we know very little about what that variation might mean. But you know, there's so this goes beyond my biology, but there's there's two ends to the constant region. And, you know, the thing that's on the other end is the thing that's actually making the antibody do something. So, you know, that to me makes the constant region important and, you know, what variation there might be there could have a real clinical significance, I think. So is there also variation in human constant regions? Yeah. Well, oh, there's a tremendous amount. Yeah. yeah. We haven't untapped it all, right? I think the, the story is very much the same as it is for the VDs and the Js. But we, yeah, we have some studies that are going on right now that hopefully will start trickling out. But yeah, the allelic var variation in the constant region, again, thinking about the heavy chain, it's, I think, probably much greater than, than we had previously thought. And of course, in terms of allelic variation that's represented in current germline databases today, it just doesn't even come close to, to capturing what's out there in the human population. We also, and it's, yeah, exactly. And I guess there's a couple points there. The other, in addition to allelic variation, just like on the V region side and the Ds and the Js, we know that there's structural variation in these in, in the constant region as well. That's actually, you know, adding copies of genes or removing them, and understanding what that means. I think for what a B cell can do, uh, or what an antibody can do, or what types of isotypes you're going to have an abundance in your repertoire, it's just never been looked at. So I think that's going to be a really interesting place to go. Historically, with that in mind, when we think about air seek analysis, for the most part, we're not really capturing that information because we've leaned really heavily into Illumina or short read based approaches. We've used them and, and collaborator here, my close collaborator, Melissa Smith, developed an approach to leverage long read pack bio that is now kind of allowing us to capture variation within these C regions and bring that information to the repertoire. And I think that's an interesting, it's an interesting opportunity, right? Because you can start asking questions that really haven't been at hand before and thinking about what does that variation in the constant region mean? Not just sort of imagining what it does downstream, but imagining what it does downstream in combination with the right BDJs. I think, you know, Again, these are questions that probably haven't really been explored in detail, but now the technology is allowing us to sort of tap into those, those 
kind of places in the repertoire that have that have been sort of sitting in the dark corners. So I think that's pretty cool. There's other things that we've come across recently too, which is that in addition to heavy chain constant region variation, there's also variation in the constant regions of the light chains as well. And these have been talked about in the literature in the past, although not much, but they have been, you know, other people have noted these things, but there's, there's actually extreme copy number variation in the lambda locus, for example, where you can have many different copies of, of C and J gene cassettes. And I have no explanation for why that, that's the case. Certainly no one's ever really looked at that. And again, when you think about the air seek analysis, nobody's really thinking about what these different C genes are even doing, and why they're there in the genome, because we don't capture that information. Standard air seek program. And so, yeah, I think, you know, it's one of these funny things. Sometimes we get we sort of get locked into our standard approaches and then that blinds us to the the things that could be going on that that you know maybe are extremely biologically important but maybe they are and you know i guess that's always what technology does right it starts opening up new avenues and new questions but i think that is what makes these loci in general very exciting because they just haven't been looked at as much as you might expect them to and, and that's the same for TCR. I mean, we've been really heavily talking about IG, but in some ways, TCR has been even more forgotten at the genomic level than IG. Um, and I'm, there's all sorts of reasons to why that's true, but um, it's definitely the case. So all TCR people out there don't, don't think that this doesn't apply to you as well. It's actually, it's the same issue, or one of the issues is the same issue anyway. You know, you... If you're lucky, you get a little bit of constant region in your B cell air seek, and you say, well, that's IgG1 or IgG2. So you're just inferring, you know, the entire thing from that little bit that you see. And again, you know, it's certainly been the case in the past that T cell people have taken the region around the CDR3. And they've said, okay, well, we know what we, we, we know what the V gene is, you know, because there's only one allele of this gene and, and its sequence in this region is this. So, you know, we can extend that out over the the whole the whole V gene now. We don't need to use long sequencing, but but there is more than one allele. You know, we published a paper a few well, a couple of years ago on T cell variation. Corey's got you know, lots of people have found variation there. And, you know, if we had the whole sequence length, then you could start using the inference tools that we spoke about earlier. And, and you know, inference will be really easy given the, the lack of lack of SHM. So the, it's kind of the same blind spot that both <laughs> TCR and BCR sequencing have, have got that, you know, technology should let us let us get it over now. Just from my understanding, do you capture all? Is all of this information captured in the more modern Gemline databases? So what we talked about with the promoters, leader sequence, and and constant regions. <laughs> so here's another problem. We, I mean, you know, Corey said how difficult it's been to sort out the nomenclature for these genes, and it has been a complete nightmare you know, nomenclature for alleles. And what do I do if I discover a new one? You know, I can't just call it star eight off my own bat because somebody else might, you know, all of that sort of stuff. We only have a nomenclature for that exon one, if you like. That's the only thing that the nomenclature covers. So we, we just don't have the language, you know, apart from the fact that we don't really have a language for describing this exon one missing the first 11 nucleotides. We don't, also have any way of naming these things right now. So no, they're, I mean, they're catalogued on VDJ base. You, you can see the different sequences there. You can look at the frequency with which they occur, but they just have crazy four letter names at the moment because there's, there's no system for naming them. And what would be naming, you know, if, you, if you've got the same allele that you see in combination with two different leader sequences, do you want to call that two different alleles for the purposes of AirSeq, or, or do you want to say this is allele X of the leader with allele Y of the, the exon? 
you know, we haven't got a decision on that. But I think the short answer to your question is that we're trying to, to get that information cataloged. And again, historically, it's been sort of hit or miss as to whether that information was kind of being dragged along with germline databases. So, uh, so I, I guess you could say by and large, in the case of human germlines, you know, we've been sort of collecting and, you know, when new alleles are named, that information is collected, right? So that you oftentimes in GenBank, you would have the coding bit, which is what the allele is being kind of defined by. And then you'd have these other sequences that were also cloned or PCR or sequenced or whatever alongside of it. Um, but that information wasn't really being provided to a user in any sort of kind of, you know, easily or readily accessible way. So if one wanted to get that information, they could, of course, download all that data and do something with it. But, but now I think because we're starting to get genomic data more in mass, we have, I mean, honestly, we have no choice but to start dealing with it, right? And it's there and we see lots of variation. And so we, we, we catalog that variation, but I think how you give it back to a user beyond sort of just the most basic formats, um, I think is, is still um, a challenge that we have to think about. At least in my mind, the way that I imagine is as we learn more about those variants and what their functional relevance might be, I think we'll be able to sort of use that information to sort of come up with more clever representations and kind of deliverables for the community. You know, you, you may not care. I mean, a given haplotype, right, may have 3,000 SNPs in it, right? Do you, does a user a standard AirSeq user care about all 3,000 of those SNPs on a haplotype? Maybe, maybe not. But I think as we start learning which ones might be re really critical or might have, you know, a big impact on how you interpret your AirSeq data, we can hopefully come up with, with sort of, I guess, more uh, useful ways to, to share that, that information. I have a hard time personally imagining how, how that would ever really sort of factor into that sort of traditional allele name. But we certainly need ways of showing people that, hey, you can have allele star 01, but that star, that coding, that co string of characters that, that defines star 01 may in fact be associated with different, you know, variants within the leader or in the RS or in the intron or other, you know, uh, currently unknown regulatory elements. But yeah, I think you can see how complicated it gets and how quickly it can get complicated, right? Especially since we haven't even really fully solved the first problem, which is getting the coding databases squared away. Just to, to make that point even, I think, clear, when you, when you go to like TCR, the, the TCR regions are even more undersampled from a database perspective. Like William was just alluding, we've published a couple papers in the last couple of years and you know i think in the second one in which we are doing full locus assemblies we found somewhere around 70 alleles that were undocumented just like 10 people right and so again if you are doing a tcr or an air seek experiment where you're looking at tcr repertoires your germline assignments without a doubt will be impacted by that missing so I, I do think that those are going to be really important areas for us to, to, to make sure we keep our head down on, get those through. Largely, that's been dictated by what William said, right, is that we just haven't had processes for getting a lot of that data through nomenclature processes, which is really the primary sort of barrier to getting these things into our traditional database format. But we're there. We're getting there. I think. I think in the next twelve months, hopefully, we're going to have a lot more to offer to the community, and I think really start make some big impacts on on these existing term one sets. I think that that reminds me. I mean, when we were talking about the importance of a good germline set, I should have said something about machine learning. You know, I I think in machine learning terms, if a good germline set, you know. And full length sequencing of TCRs will provide much less noisy data set. You should have a much better signal if you do that. 
And, you know, given all the work that people are putting into trying to find good models and training good models and, you know, languages and things, just doing something as simple as that could make a big difference. All right. I think we're coming to the end. So I'll pull back a bit and kind of type question about uh, the clinical use of, of air sequencing and, and the database. Right. One of the conundrums around air sequencing and the clinical use is sort of there hasn't really been a tangible application in terms of diagnostics or therapeutics. And so, you know, even prior to speaking to, or prior to speaking to both of you, I think I underappreciated the variation or sort of the noise that's in these reference sets. And so I guess, you know, what it sounds like you're building is something that is going to, you know, help us find the signal in that noise. So once we reach there, do you, you know, what are you most excited about uh, how air sequencing is going to be used in the clinical setting? Yeah, in my mind, it's sort of twofold, right? I think, you know, the, the honestly, like the, the big push behind really trying to improve germline databases early on in kind of the air C realm, it really was about, you know, trying to make sure that we do a better job of analyzing our air seek data. There's really this kind of like technical need, right? Everyone was doing air seek and they're, they were realizing, oh, well, you know, I'm not getting good assignments or I'm over inferring semantic heart mutation because my germline database is complete. And that's been a good motivator for us, I think, to try to get this new system in place and to do a better job of promoting you know, inclusion of more and more data, um, because I think the technical implications are that, you know, in any data analysis, you want to do as well as you can, right? You want to limit the error, or you want to get as close to the truth as you can, right? And so, I, to me, I think that's important if we want to think about how you're going to use error-seek data in the clinic, right? If you have a bunch of noise in your analysis, uh, in my opinion, there's no amount of machine learning that that sort of makes up for that, right? Or at least we shouldn't settle for that, right? I think we should continue to make sure that our data is as accurate as it, as it should be. So I think there's that really, there's that technical motivation. Along the way, you know, the geeks like me who are interested in the genome level have also started to appreciate that the germline variation is even more extensive than, than we may have thought, right? And that we've come to learn how little we actually know about variation in these regions and how little we actually know about what that variation might mean for the biological questions that we're all interested in. So I think it's, for someone like me who've been kind of studying these regions for a long time, it's been interesting to watch kind of how this field's evolved in the last decade we have these really important components of the immune system, yet we lack some really fundamental knowledge, right, about how these things show up in a repertoire, what mechanisms regulate uh, their expression, and then carrying that through to what that means for disease states, um, I think is just almost baffling that we understand so little about it. And so for me, well, I don't have a sort of straight line A to B answer to what does this mean for the clinic? I think it could mean a lot more than just that technical variation. I think what we have to do now, those of us who are interested in these questions at least, is really start trying to peel back the layers of what's going on at the genome and really try to understand how much contribution does that genomic variation make to the repertoire? And then how important is that for how we interpret the variation that we see in the repertoire, whether that be in healthy individuals or, you know, uh, individuals with disease X, Y, or Z, or individuals receiving vaccine at ABC, right? I think these are the questions that at least me personally are really interested in because if we can start untangling some of that and understand what is the contribution that genetics makes, then I think it makes all the current sort of diagnostic approaches using, you know, machine learning and whatnot, even more powerful. And, you know, I think at the, at the end of the day, we won't know those things unless we look, right? If we continue to overlook them, then I don't think they're, they're, they'll ever be integrated into these models. 
And just to end on that, I think there are some examples now, right, where we can see that. And most of these examples are pretty simple from a context standpoint, where we know that germline variation matters in the clinic. And probably one of the, I think, coolest ones that, that we've learned very recently is looking at germline targeting immunogens in the HIV space, right? So there's several that, have, that are going through clinical trials, including one clinical trial that was just published, right, where we know that the allele genotype at a particular gene influences the vaccine response directly. And so I think there's going to be more cases like these where, you know, having that germline information gives us insight into what our expectations might be in a given cohort of individuals. So that's what I look forward to seeing in the future is in terms of, of how we, you know, try to make use of not just germline databases, but germline variation in these loci in general. I think something in the nearer future. And I think it was in Genoa when the diagnostics group was being first talked about. Uh, somebody said, you know, if you want to use something in a clinic, you've got to be able to put a label on it. You know, we've got these HLA haplotypes and they're well known, you know, and, and the, you can read them and look at them. And, you know, I think they said you should put the genotype on a barcode, you know, until you've got it on a barcode on a patient's form. You know, it's not really usable in the clinic. And, you know, we're probably going to need a big barcode, at least to start off with, because we don't really know what's important. But, you know, once we get those labels there, people can start to look at correlations and work out significance. And anyways, these are the final words uh, from our guest on this uh, 15th episode of On Air, the podcast of the Air Community with special focus on clinical use of the adaptive immune receptor repertoires. The podcast is supported by the Antibody Society. Please go to the website, antibodysociety.org, to get more information about our sponsors. And if you have any comments or questions, you can drop us a line at onair at aircommunity.org or tweet using the hashtag onair with two hours. All contact information and uh, links to the papers mentioned uh, are in the show notes below. Thank you so much for joining us, Corey and William. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having us. We will return in one month's time with more thoughts on the clinical use of air sequencing. With that, thank you so much for listening to On Air. Bye-bye now.